Welcome to the show. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. As of today, nearly all of the Russian military forces that were gathered along Ukraine's border before the invasion have entered the country. That's according to a senior U.S. defense official. And though Ukraine has so far put up a stiff resistance against Russia, Moscow has escalated its bombing of major cities, fueling concerns that Putin may not view civilians as off limits. The United Nations has recorded at least 1,200 civilian casualties in Ukraine since Russia first invaded. NBC News has not independently confirmed that number, but military experts say it's likely a significant undercount as Russia ramps up its attacks. An advisor to the president of Ukraine said that as of today, 202 schools, 34 hospitals, and more than 1,500 residential buildings have been destroyed since the war began. Nearly 1,000 towns and villages are completely deprived of electricity, water, and heat, he also added. Those are the conditions Ukrainian citizens find themselves in 12 days into the invasion, and the U.N. estimates more than 1.7 million of them are now seeking refuge elsewhere, with more than a million in Poland alone. It became the fastest growing refugee crisis in Europe since World War II. Over the weekend, talks between Russia and Ukraine for a ceasefire to create safe civilian evacuation routes failed, largely because Ukrainian officials rejected Moscow's suggested routes, which it would have directed civilians into Belarus or even Russia. But there were signs of some progress on that front today, with Russia announcing a ceasefire in five Ukrainian cities, including the capital of Kyiv, starting tomorrow. Joining me now with the latest on the ground is NBC News correspondent Cal Perry. He's in Lviv, Ukraine right now. Cal, bring us up to speed. How is Ukraine faring 12 days into this? Well, look, I think we talk a lot, we hear a lot from the Pentagon about how the Russians are getting bogged down, how they're being slowed down. And, and I think militarily that's true. You have this two-front war coming from the south, Russians moving up from Crimea and from the north moving south from Russia. And while they're moving slowly and they may be getting bogged down, they are surrounding these Ukrainian cities. They're cutting off the power. They're cutting off the water. Uh, they're depriving people of heat. And they're then bombarding these cities. Now, the State Department puts it one of two ways. They're either indiscriminately shelling or they are directly targeting civilians. We, we've seen evidence of both in the last sort of 24 hours. As these humanitarian corridors, quote unquote, opened up, we saw the Russians actually targeting civilians as they tried to leave these various cities. It is something that is undermining not only the negotiations, but this idea that you can get sort of people out safely. Kyiv is slowly being tightened. You're starting to see Russian troops now on the outskirts of that city. My colleague Richard Engel was reporting that even folks in the suburbs there, civilians who who are caught in the suburbs are moving into the city. They're afraid to leave, so they're moving closer into those urban areas. The problem is, of course, the Russians could surround it. They could just start shelling it. They may not let anybody out. Where I am in the West, we're seeing that humanitarian crisis that you talk about. 1.7 million people have already left the country. That doesn't account for the million-plus folks who are displaced internally, many of them coming to the city where I am. I am 350 miles from the capital of Kyiv, a place that was supposed to be safe but a place now that we have air raid sirens going off pretty regularly, a place that seems to be bracing itself for a possible Russian incursion. Zelina? What are you hearing from Ukrainian citizens on the ground where you are? I mean, how is their morale, given the fact that the situation is so fluid and we've seen ramped up attacks on civilian targets in the last couple of days? So I think we've moved from the sort of shock that this happened. And keep in mind, um, you know, the Ukrainian president two weeks ago was saying that the chances of a Russian invasion were low. And you had a population here that seemed to not believe what Washington is saying. Well, that's very clearly changed now. And in the past few days, I think folks have gone from sort of shock to being upset. There's more and more talk here on the ground about um, some kind of a no-fly zone. You know, the battle for the airspace uh, is key here because the Russians are just hitting targets from the air, and, and, and they're doing so in some spots sort of unchecked. In other places, we know that there's this air battle going on. But here on the ground, you have incredible amounts of suffering, of course, from these refugees as they flee. Uh, but you have this now 
continued effort to try to get the West to do more, whether it's weapons, a no-fly zone, anything to try to stop the bombardment, especially in the northern part of the country. The northern part of the country, it's called the Sumi region. There are at least a dozen villages and towns that seem to be under constant bombardment. And so that's why, Zerlina, you have this push for this no-fly zone. It may not be politically um, possible. Obviously, NATO has said they have this deconfliction line. They want to avoid, you know, World War III, according to the NATO Secretary General. But on the ground here, you have a real desire to see the West engage more and stop this violence. Cal, are you hearing that directly from people on the ground? Obviously, policymakers and analysts and experts are having the conversation about a no-fly zone. Are people on the ground bringing that up as something that they would like to see? Definitely. I mean, we've heard that from refugees who are fleeing here, that they want a no-fly zone, because so many of the folks who came here—I spoke to a young woman from Kharkiv. It's 600 miles from where I am, and her train passed through the capital of Kyiv. And she said as the train was passing through the capital, the bombs were falling all around them. The violence was, was everywhere. There was nowhere to run. They were packed on this train full of civilians, um, and they just felt like they were in a shooting gallery. Um, and she was saying if there had been air cover, maybe that would have made the difference. There is also an awareness though, I, I will say here on the ground um, that the first shot fired by NATO could cause a wider conflict. People here definitely don't want to see that, um, but it's a matter of perspective, right? If your family is being bombed at this moment, you'll do anything to stop it. And, you know, talk of World War III is a little bit lost on the folks who are fleeing with their children already. Important context there. Cal Perry, thank you so much for your incredible re reporting, and please stay safe. An attack on Irpin on Sunday, just west of Ukraine's capital, has become one of the latest examples of Russian military forces disregarding civilians amid its onslaught. New York Times photographer captured the moment a Russian mortar shell struck and left four people dead, including a mother and her two children. They were attempting to cross a bridge that was intentionally damaged by Ukrainian soldiers to slow down Russia's advance on Kyiv. That's a circumstance that a countless number of Ukrainians now find themselves in. NBC's chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel was there today as many more attempted to flee the fighting. The Russians have now arrived at the gates of Kiev. This footbridge is one of the only ways people are able to escape a much more intense battle on the side that the Russians have taken over and get to relative safety. The Russians have taken over this suburb, which is on the northern edge of Kiev. They are bombarding it heavily. The Ukrainians blew up this bridge in order to slow down the Russian advance, but it has also made it extremely difficult for people to evacuate these areas that are hotly contested as Russian forces try and consolidate their positions and the Ukrainians try to keep them, uh, keep them on that side of the river. And all day, we have seen a stream of panicked people, some being carried, some in wheelchairs. They are each carrying one bag at a, at a maximum. Some families have been separated here, broken down into tears. But this is now a, a small evacuation, a, a reverse evacuation, where people are leaving the suburbs, heading into the center of Kiev, hoping that they can find relative safety there in numbers in the built-up part of the city. Thank you to NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel for that report. And joining me now to help break down the latest in the conflict is General Barry McCaffrey. General, a senior U.S. defense official says nearly all of Russia's troops have entered Ukraine. They've fired 625 missiles, yet so far they've only taken control of one major city, Kyrgyzstan. How is Ukraine faring 12 days into this? Well, it depends on your perspective. The Ukrainian armed forces are doing remarkably well. Uh, they don't have an, a, an active high-performance aircraft. They don't have armor to speak of. Uh, they're using uh, U.S. and NATO-supplied uh, anti-tank guided missiles and Stinger uh, anti-air missiles. Uh, they have definitely uh, brought the, the mass of the Russian forces to a halt in the north, and they're still holding Odessa in the south against amphibious landings and shelling from the sea. It's remarkable. But the civilian population, Zerlina, 
is a catastrophe. There's a deliberate terror campaign using artillery and rockets and cruise missiles and ballistic missiles uh, to pound urban areas and terrorize the population. Uh, they're running out of food, medical supplies. Uh, they're fleeing as many of them as can get there to the, to the West, to Poland, Romania, Hungary, uh, Moldova. Uh, but it's a catastrophe. And to that point about the humanitarian crisis, the White House National Security Council told NBC News that the U.S. is collecting evidence of, quote, possible war crimes, human rights abuses, and violations of international law. I mean, break this all down for us and the significance uh, of that as Russia targets civilians. And we're seeing that with videos uh, like the one we just showed everyone from The New York Times. Well, of course, it's a, it's a good parallel effort, uh, part of a diplomatic effort to hold the Russians accountable. Not much will come of it. Uh, these are some of these international criminal court cases go on for a decade. Uh, largely, the crisis in Ukraine will be decided, in my view, in under 90 days. Uh, it's a savage uh, campaign that does illegally target civilians. Uh, these are not precision strikes against military positions. Uh, they're trying to stun the population and force them to flee or quit. Uh, but I'm glad they're doing it. They're going to try and collect evidence. And it's another cautionary tale for the generals, for Putin, for the political system, that the global community is watching what's going on. In terms of what can be done in the short term, I think, as you mentioned, something like the International Criminal Court can take up to a decade. I mean, what can be done? What more can be done in the short term to change the reality of the images we're seeing? The U.S. sent 500 more American troops to Eastern Europe, bringing our total count to roughly 100,000. I mean, I feel like we've talked. You and I have talked about the risk of escalation here. But what else can be done in the short term? These images are difficult to watch. Yeah, they really are. Well, look, the, the most uh, astonishing thing to me is how quickly the U.S. European Command, along with cooperating nations, the Brits, the French, the uh, uh, Germans and others, have organized a cross-border reinforcement of the Ukrainian military uh, fighting units with the Stinger missiles, with Javelin missiles, with ammunition, uh, with military rations, uh, with helmets and body armor. Uh, and, and other supplies. And now I'm uh, now we're seeing a lot of these NGOs, uh, these wonderful humanitarian organizations are also putting multiple tons of food and aid across the border uh, for the civilians. So I think that is uh, simply magnificent. But that doesn't deny the fact that three million people in this giant, beautiful city of Kiev are under artillery bombardment and are uh, just in dreadful circumstances. I think the sound of the dogs barking after uh, the artillery shells uh, explode is something that's going to stay with me for, for a long while. I mean, Ukrainian officials continually have been asking for a no-fly zone. Can you break that decision and analysis down for us, for folks. I mean, Cal Perry just reported on the ground, Ukrainians on the ground are, are also bringing this up. Why, why is this such a contentious issue? Help us understand. Well, the poor Ukrainian people are desperate, and that includes their political leadership, this remarkable, brave young uh, president, Zelensky. So they, they, they want some dramatic help. A no-fly zone means that either NATO or the United States would go in and deny the airspace uh, to Russian uh, fighters, fighter bombers. Uh, presumably, that would also include helicopters at low level. It would obviously have to include the U.S. being willing to strike uh, Russian air defense units inside Ukraine. Uh, the S-400 uh, anti-missile system uh, from the Russians is across the border. It's got a 400-kilometer range. It's incredibly sophisticated, a great danger to anybody's uh, air force. We'd have to go strike that. And by the way, at the end of the day, 
does that mean, well, it's okay to kill these people with artillery and rockets, but not uh, fighter bombers? Most of the damage is being done by bombardment from the ground. What they really want is a U.S. air power or NATO air power to come in and strike the Russians on the ground and ban them from, from the air. We're not going to do that. You know, it, it, uh, it will immediately bring direct combat with the Russians. And by the way, feasible, yes, the uh, U.S. Air Force can knock these people uh, out of Ukraine in a week. But then we start a wider war. So the president, I think, wisely has said, we're not going to do that. We're going to try and support them. We're going to shore up NATO with significant reinforcements and technology. Serlina, this is a 10-year problem. This is a turning point with Putin and his criminal regime. In terms of Putin's mental state in the, at this particular moment, I think there's been a lot of speculation as to whether COVID isolation, perhaps him spending time a la per uh, Fiona Hill in the attic of the Kremlin, surrounded by old maps. That was the image she sort of brought up because he's been uh, isolated in the Kremlin for the two years of the pandemic. I mean, how much of that is a factor as policymakers decide what they can and cannot do without instigating a wider conflict? Well, I, there's no doubt in my mind that he's desperate and scared. This thing has landed him in a terrible mess. He didn't think through it. Uh, he didn't realize the Ukrainians would fight so effectively or that the global community would come together in a week and apply crippling economic sanctions and a hundred other uh, measures that are going to cause tremendous difficulty for him to maintain his leadership position in the regime. Uh, so I, th I think he's uh, acting very strangely. The worst thing to me is his the multiple times now he has directly implied that he's prepared to use nuclear weapons. If you're an okay. ignorant civilian, uh, you know, with a death wish, you can talk about using uh, nuclear weapons. But he's been educated. He understands what's involved in a potential nuclear exchange. Now, that includes tactical nuclear weapons. What? Use them against the Ukrainians? Use them against uh, NATO forces? Uh, if the Russians conducted a first strike on the United States, an Armageddon strike, within 40 hours, the Russians would be vaporized. So no one can win a nuclear conflict and exchange, and he knows that. Why is he making these statements? Never mind watching these bizarre videos come out that he's released, showing him sitting 30 feet from his minister of defense and chief of the general staff with two armed guards sitting near the door, standing near the door. He's isolated. He's acting in a very irresponsible manner. Apparently, he's appearing in the military headquarters and yelling at people, uh, trying to energize this um, really uh, incompetent invasion of Ukraine. It is uh, very scary to hear that analysis, but it's important for us to all understand it and process it as we're living through it. General Barry McCaffrey, thank you so much for your analysis and expertise. Please stay safe. Could be. Coming up, how much are you willing to spend on a gallon of gas? Prices at the pump are going up. And next, we'll look at how much and if prices have to get worse before they get any better. We'll be right back. The decision has been made at this point uh, by the president about uh, an, uh, a ban, an import, a ban on importing uh, oil from Russia, uh, and those discussions are ongoing internally and also with our counterparts uh, and uh, partners uh, in Europe and around the world. That was White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki earlier today responding to growing calls to ban imports of Russian oil. It's a move that's getting more and more support from Republicans and Democrats in Congress. And earlier today, lawmakers announced bipartisan legislation to ban the import of energy products from Russia. But what's making all of this a little bit complicated is what Americans are seeing at the gas pump, gas prices reaching near all-time highs with the fear they could go even higher with a Russian oil ban. NBC News business and tech correspondent Jolene Kent has more. 
The sticker shock nationwide is real. Take a look behind me, almost $7 for a gallon of regular. The national average right now, $4.07, approaching the record for the most amount ever on average. This has so many drivers acknowledging what is happening, the war, the invasion of Ukraine, but it doesn't make affording gas any easier. The pain of the pump is off the charts. If it's going to be seven now, it's going to be nine pretty soon. Seven dollars a gallon, a reality at some gas stations in Los Angeles. The unbelievable prices are reverberating nationwide. The national average for a gallon of regular is now four dollars and seven cents. That's 46 cents more than just a week ago. If they keep fighting this war, I believe it exceeds five dollars in less than a month. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is driving prices higher. In fact, they've jumped every single day since the war began. Although the U.S. does not rely as heavily on Russian oil as many other countries do, expected sanctions both here and abroad will make a tight global crude oil market even tighter, sending prices even higher. The oil market reacts much like the stock market, and unfortunately drivers are, are paying for that at the gas pump. And with inflation spiking 7.5% and hourly wages only growing about 5%, many already stretched budgets have been shattered. The last time I put gas in my car, when it got to $40, I quit and it still wasn't full. In Georgia, 73-year-old Carolyn Hartfield relies solely on her Social Security check and her positive attitude. I do not do unnecessary trips. How much are you looking forward to the day the gas costs less? Oh, my gosh. I'm really looking forward to that. With prices going the way that they are, Americans are now on pace to spend more than half a trillion dollars on gas this year alone. Of course, that's gotten a lot more people interested in alternative energy electric vehicles. There's one dealership up in the Bay Area here in California that says demand is up 10x. Jolene Ken, thank you so much for that excellent reporting. In addition to rising gas prices, there's also concern Russia's invasion of Ukraine and a potential ban on Russian imports could have a deeper impact on the global economy writ large. In fact, according to CNBC, just the discussion of banning Russian oil had European stocks in freefall today. It's also sparking concern of stagflation, which is a period of slow economic growth coupled with high unemployment and high inflation. And joining me now to discuss is Professor Ken Rogoff. He's an economics professor at Harvard University. And Professor, I want to play some sound from earlier today. Senator Mark Warner of Virginia on MSNBC said that President Biden may enact a ban on Russian oil in just a matter of hours. Take a listen. How quickly do you think we are going to see action from the Biden administration if it ultimately assesses that the U.S. does have to go it alone? Could it happen in the next 24 hours? I think it could happen in the next 24, 36 hours. Uh, this clearly got an enormous amount of, of bipartisan support. I think the administration was moving uh, methodically on this. I think we accelerated that. So, Professor, break this down for us. If this happens, what's the potential impact on everyday Americans? Well, prices are going up as it is. They were going up before the war in the Ukraine. And the uh, war in the Ukraine has added more inflation. You know, however high it was, could be higher, and it's certainly not good for growth. Uh, the truth of the matter is that we don't import very much from Russia. We shouldn't import anything, but compared to the Europeans, maybe a tenth as much. So, in terms of the whole global market, the effect's not so big. And what one of the corners, one of the difficulties for the president is the prices might be going up anyway, and if he enacts this ban, he'll get blamed. But the moral case really is very compelling with the horrific scenes that you've been showing that are going on in Ukraine. In terms of the impact on the overall global economy that's been recovering slowly but surely in this global pandemic, what impact would banning Russian oil have on the global picture? Again, we're small players in this. Like we produce, we're the biggest oil producer. Uh, we don't import very much, but what we import uh, from Russia is maybe eight percent of our oil needs, or something like that. So it, it's it's more of a gesture. We are doing it 
in part to tell the Europeans, look, we've done it, you do it. But for the Europeans, uh, completely cutting off oil and gas is very, very painful. But um, I don't know what they're going to do next. I mean, we uh, have done really incredible sanctions. I see the Russian payment system is conceivably collapsing in the next four weeks with just the financial sanctions we put on with all the technology we've taken away. These are brutal, unprecedented sanctions that we put on Russia already. But uh, time is short for the Ukrainians. And again, for the US, there's a very strong moral case for doing this. Your previous uh, uh, general you had on pointed to Putin's unstable state. He already considers okay. the sanctions that we have an act of war. What if this is considered even worse? Is there any precedent for a ban on importing Russian oil? And if so, what happened then? There's lots of precedents for trade bans. We've done that a lot with smaller countries. I think the situation's doing this on top of everything else we've done. We have done unprecedented financial sanctions on Russia, at least for a large country like this. And it's having just a brutal effect. But the thing is, the government really depends on these oil revenues. I think it gets 40% of its revenues, and oil is really much more important than gas to the Soviet economy. So if we really, really wanted to bring them to their knees and we're really serious about it, we would indeed put oil sanctions on. But I'm sure President Biden and his advisors are asking the question, you know, how far are we willing to go? It's not just about gas at the pump. It's not just about heat in Europe. It's also about facing a very unstable lead in Russia, and where are you? How are you trying to give them an off ramp? Because once we do this, the economy is already collapsing, and this would blow up the government budget. So it's a dramatic step, but you know, he may not stop otherwise. So I certainly understand why everyone's talking about it. One of the things you told Fortune recently is that Russia may be seriously hurt from sanctions, but it will not run out of cash fast enough to save Ukraine. I mean, break this down for us. How realistic is it for us to sort of buy into this narrative that these economic sanctions somehow will bankrupt the Russian military and they won't be able to carry out whatever goal Putin has for them in Ukraine? So there's very little precedent for the extreme, what, what we've been doing to them. Uh, and that I was talking about the financial sanctions that we've done so far. But the Russian government's mm -hmm. getting oil like crazy. They pump oil, they get their revenue from oil. The price is, is up from $75 to $120 plus today. They're making more money than they were before. They have lots of money. And if you really want to cut off the money that fuels this war, the, gov the government, it is the oil. Uh, but it's very painful for Europe. They import uh, 10 times as much as we do. They import the gas. They really would be switching off the lights and you know, taking their factories offline if they start stop completely. But uh, certainly for Russia, uh, that's the big source of revenue. But will it stop the war? There's not a lot of optimism in the history of sanctions of these things stopping the war. I, I think the hope might be that it caused some reaction inside Russia that pushed Putin out, but he's sitting there in some mountain in the Urals, you know, with very security conscious, protected from anyone. So we have to play this very carefully, just as with the no-fly zone. I think the no-trade zone, you also have to play very carefully in this, and we have to take it step by step. Banning Russian oil for the United States is not the killer move for them. It's a, it's a moral statement because we're not that big. We're making a gesture saying to the Europeans, look, you're paying for this. You're the ones really giving them the money. What are you prepared to do? In terms of some of the asymmetric nature of, of what's going on here, certainly people are talking about escalation in the traditional military sense. But you've talked about a cyber attack as retaliation for some, not just some of these economic sanctions, but anything seen as escalation from Putin's pers perspective. Unpack for us what that could look like potentially and, you know, how much, how, what's the likelihood that that is going to happen. 
To be honest, I'm surprised they haven't taken some gestures already because the financial sanctions we put on them have been so harsh. But the Russians almost certainly have some penetration into our electric grid, our financial infrastructure. We don't know exactly what. I think the big risk for them is just like with nuclear, we can do worse to them. So they're not going to lightly undertake cyber. But if Putin thinks he's getting out of power and he's willing to pull out all the stops, cyber is a very natural place to go. He can also try to hide it. Oh, it wasn't me, although that's kind of hard to believe if it's coming out of Russia right now. Important context. And I keep an eye on the cyber stuff because I worked for Hillary Clinton in 2016. <laughs> I'm a little obsessed with it. Professor Ken Rogoff, yeah. thank you so much for being here tonight and for helping us understand Thank all you. of this. Please stay safe. Coming up, what does the path of this military invasion of Ukraine look like? I'll talk to MSNBC national security analyst Clint Watts about what exactly is happening on the ground. The Russian military's squeeze of key cities in Ukraine is ramping up, with a senior defense official confirming to NBC News that nearly 100 percent of Russian troops that had amassed around Ukraine are now inside of the country. But the Kremlin says it's willing and ready to stop its invasion, quote, in a moment, if Ukraine meets its request. A Kremlin spokesperson told Reuters Moscow is demanding Ukraine ceases military action, changes its constitution to include neutrality, recognizes Crimea as a Russian territory, and acknowledges the independence of two separatist republics. And joining me now is NBC, MSNBC national security analyst Clint Watts. He's been tracking the Russian military's movements inside of Ukraine. And Clint, what is the, la the latest on Russia's military invasion uh, since we last talked? Yeah, Zerlina, really a two-front war at this point. <laughs> I'm going to start in the north and talk about Kyiv, because that's where a lot of the action that we've been talking about. Richard Engel, you probably saw him in an area called Irpin earlier today. That area is still contested. The Ukrainians putting up a stiff fight. This is where that convoy was. What you're finding is the Russians are not using infantry in and around their armor. You have the Ukrainian military essentially sending in uh, individual soldiers with anti-tank, anti-aircraft doing massive damage uh, to this convoy area and any assault that's coming through here. They've done an amazing job of holding Kyiv, although it's still taking quite a pounding from indirect fire. Separately, what you're seeing is some advances by the Russians in this area. Here from Sumy, where they struggled over the first week into the second week of the war, they're advancing in and around Kyiv. They're trying to essentially bring together all these axes of advance to surround Kyiv. If they can do that, they can essentially put the city under siege like other areas they've done in the south. But they got big problems on their hands for a few reasons. Here, just uh, to the southeast of Kharkiv, this is a contested area again with uh, Ukrainian fighters essentially going back, taking some ground, uh, putting up stiff resistance. And you can see they've not linked up with Donbass, which is a place that actually Russia already controlled. Now, that doesn't tell the full story of what's going on Separately, we have to jump to the south. That's where things are quite a bit different. In the south, remember uh, from last week, we talked about they advanced on Mariupol. This is now a humanitarian disaster. That city is under siege. This is where we're, we're talking about Ukrainians needing some place to go, and the Russians made the ridiculous offer of these humanitarian, essentially cordons, a pathway, but they offered it into Russia and Belarus. Obviously, no Ukrainian wants to retreat or move out of the cities into Russia. They'd be traded terribly. This would be used as Russian disinformation back at home. Now, separately from here, one of the important things we need to watch is where they are making gains and what Russia might try and do or settle on. Here, we saw them advance out of Crimea to Kherson. That was back Thursday night. From here to Mykolaiv, that was on Friday night. They took the bridge here. They took the bridge here in Mykolaiv for a while. However, they've, again, met resistance from the Ukrainians. And the Ukrainians claim to have taken back part of this. You saw protests in Kherson over the weekend. The Russians are moving their armored convoys so far forward. They're not essentially securing their rear area. Makes for tough, tough fight in terms of logistics and sustaining this. Last point is, watch for this. The Russians want to essentially advance to Moldova. There is a breakaway republic of ethnic Russians known as Trans Transnistria, which is right here. There are some Russian peacekeepers, otherwise known as military forces there. If they can link this area up and essentially 
come back here to Odessa and take this city here. It's the financial and, and cer uh, certainly the industrial center of all Ukraine. This area in the south is a major wheat producing area. Unlikely Ukrainians will be able to grow wheat there this year. This would seal them off from the south. And the biggest thing is what Putin has always said he wanted to do, which is unite all Russian people in one place known as Nova Russia or New Russia, a republic here that once existed in the late 1700s. Putin talks about this quite a bit, essentially making another statelet on, on the north uh, end of the Black Sea. In terms of the, Rus uh, the Ukrainian resistance, excuse me, how long do you think they will be able to hold Russia off? You mentioned here um, down at the southern part, they've been able to sort of take half of one of these cities back. But certainly, if they keep getting pounded by Russian troops, um, they may lose that even half. So break down for us how long the resistance has before they're overwhelmed. Well, several things are changing, Zerlina. One, you got to look at it from a logistics standpoint. It's about food, fuel, and ammunition. In terms of that, Russia's supply lines are too many and too long. There's no way they can keep up this fight. And more importantly, they've not secured their rear areas here to do resupply, which means they keep taking losses or having to come back and essentially secure areas. Above that, it's about personnel and manpower. Russia's committed about 95 percent, according to the Pentagon, uh, of their manpower and, and uh, combat power into Ukraine. But just in the last few days, what have you seen? Massive uptick in resupplies in terms of anti-tank, uh, anti-aircraft weapons coming in from the West. You're talking about airplanes, potentially, um, from Poland. And even more uh, interesting is foreign fighters, essentially, coming and volunteering to come serve in Ukraine. So all of this dynamics over time really comes down to the will to fight for the Russians versus the will of the Ukrainians and the logistics backbone for each. Just one last question about that convoy that we talked about last week, about 40 miles long, which I don't know how many football fields that is, but I'm trying to sort of get a mental picture in my mind. Give us an update on that convoy. Where is it and what's happening with it? So what's interesting about this convoy, this picture is a little bit old. Uh, it comes from last week. But as you can see, it's just stacked up. And they're having logistical and supply problems, but they're also having other problems, which is on this, in this area here where they're essentially trying to advance in, you're seeing the Ukrainians come back, circling around and hitting this convoy in the middle or in the rear. There's a report, essentially, they detonated a bridge behind the start of that convoy, essentially making it almost impossible for further elements to come across. And they've been hitting the logistics train. So, They've done a remarkable job, the Ukrainian resistance, at stopping this. I think the big concern is once you have another axis of advance, then you'll see Ukrainian forces have to essentially block in two directions. That's when things will get really tough for them to sustain over time. Clint Watts, thank you so much for helping us understand the latest, and please stay safe. Thank you. Sky News has spoken to families fleeing their homes in the Ukrainian town of Irpin, just outside of Kyiv, due to endured, sustained shelling by Russia's military. Some claim Russian forces are targeting schools and even hospitals, and that children have been killed in the conflict. Sky News special correspondent, at, correspondent Alex Crawford reports from Irpin. They were running for their lives. <laughs> Frantically trying to keep their families together amid the mayhem and gunfire, desperately handing over their toddlers to soldiers and strangers, scrambling to get away from the firing and shelling even as they fled. Many have spent days under fire, trapped in their homes until they realized it was run or die, with the Russians getting closer. And the soldiers in my city, Russian soldiers. And Irpin, on the outskirts of the capital, is being relentlessly shelled. And there's no escape, not even for the civilians you can see at the top of your picture, running with their cases to get away. This is an entirely residential area. Two children and their mother were killed outright. But this area is filled with families, utterly powerless against this attacking army. The bombed bridge connecting Irpin with Kiev is now a target for the Russian troops. 
and those trying to escape came under fire several times. The Ukrainian soldiers tried to shoot down drones, pinpointing the positions of the fleeing families. Those rushing to get out are the most vulnerable, who felt too nervous to try to escape until now, when there was no other option. But this route, used by hundreds 24 hours earlier, is now desperately dangerous. And the attackers are showing no mercy. Well, that was the loudest we've heard. Yeah, we better go out now. Um, there's a lot of incoming now, and it's getting a lot closer. The Russian military is pushing forward towards the capital and is taking ground, killing and injuring as they do so. And a lot of the casualties are civilians, hurt by shrapnel and mortars fired in heavily populated built-up areas. Attacking civilians and non-combatants is an international war crime. And multiple families gave us first-hand accounts, many who only just survived themselves. I was helping people evacuate near the bridge and I wanted to give some chocolate to a child and there was a family of four there, but only the mother survived. A child about 13 or 15 was hit by two bits of shrapnel in the head and died immediately. All three of them died. President Putin says he's not attacking civilians. What would you say to, to that? They're shelling civilians directly, she tells us. Not any military place or object. They're shooting at schools, on hospitals. They're shooting everywhere, all the time, for the last three days. What's happened? That's what they've come from. They show us the damage done to their home and the residential buildings around them and in their street. When we got out of our home, I saw five, six shells, maybe. Every building was destroyed and had been hit. The stream of people fleeing are traumatized, but many are also angry and full of despair. Putin's a war criminal, she says, the Antichrist. You've been waiting for him, now you've got him. Families have been torn apart in the chaos. They ran into Irpin from a village outside before escaping Irpin too, and they've left elderly relatives behind. All, all houses are in fire, and that's all that they can see. How much destruction is there that you can see in the in the town center? I think all all destroyed. There is nothing to help. Uh, there is nothing to build or defend. There is nothing. I came here and I left my parents to die, she tells us. And I told my husband, "You've got to go back and bring them here because I can't just leave them to die." <laughs> But in amongst this suffering and trauma, there are small glimpses of hope. Her 81-year-old mother and father are found. And the family is reunited. How could I live without you, she says. There is incredible heartache and fear, but also an astonishing defiance about these people. Alex Crawford, Sky News in Irpin. That was Sky News' Alex Crawford reporting. Thank you very much. Before we go to break, 57 years ago today, civil rights activists, including the late Congressman John Lewis, led hundreds of marchers across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, in a nonviolent protest for voting rights. And that march, the first of three, ended in the tragic incident we now commemorate as Bloody Sunday, when troopers attacked the peaceful protesters with billy clubs and tear gas even though the protesters did not fight back. It was also a turning point in the fight for voting rights in this country. It led to Congress approving and President Johnson signing the Voting Rights Act into law. But with GOP-led states across the country putting in place laws that suppress the vote, like right now, and the Washington lawmakers failing to pass federal voting rights protections right now, Vice President Harris used her speech in Selma yesterday, marking the anniversary of Bloody Sunday, to call for action. We must lock our arms and march forward. We will not let setbacks stop us. We know that honoring the legacy of those who marched then demands that we continue to push Congress to pass federal voting rights legislation. 
And it also demands we continue to push the Senate to not allow an arcane rule to deny us this sacred right. While the world is focused on Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the U.S. government is also moving ahead with the historic nomination of Judge Ketanji Brown-Jackson to the U.S. Supreme Court. Senate hearings on her nomination are scheduled to start in two weeks, and Jackson is now making the customary rounds on Capitol Hill to meet key senators from both parties. Jackson is the first woman, black woman, ever nominated to the high court, and her qualifications include serving as a federal appellate court judge, a U.S. district court judge, and a federal public defender. But there's also one qualification we really haven't heard a lot about. Jackson is a working mom. One of her daughters, along with her husband, attended her nomination ceremony last month, and Jackson called attention to her double duties that day. To my daughters, Talia and Layla, you are the light of my life. Please know that whatever title I may hold or whatever job I may, may have, I will still be your mom. That will never change. When Justice Amy Coney Barrett was nominated in 2020, some Republican senators repeatedly called attention to her being a mother of seven kids. If Jackson is confirmed, she and Barrett will be the only mothers on the entire court. Democrats have said basically not Jack, nothing, nothing about Jackson's also being a working mom, as New York University law professor Melissa Murray points out in a New York Times op-ed. And Melissa Murray joins us now. I mean, you note in your op-ed that one possible reason that Democrats haven't talked up Judge Jackson being a working mom is that black women have been working moms like for the last hundred years. I mean, 200 years, if we're being more accurate, going back to when they were domestic workers taking care of other people's kids and also had to take care of their own. So lay out for us how black working moms is basically just a fixed notion in the public's mind, and we never bring it up. I mean, Michelle Obama got so much flack for talking about being a mom in chief. So there's a lot packed into this idea of black motherhood. Break it down for us. Yeah, I think it's a really important point to underscore. You know, we saw with the confirmation of Justice Barrett that her maternity, the fact that she was a mother of seven children, was really celebrated and not just celebrated. It was actually used as a shield to insulate her from charges that her judicial philosophy was out of step with the norm, that she might dismantle key portions of the domestic agenda, like the Affirmative Care, the Affordable Care Act, and that she was perhaps um, not suited because of the hastiness of her confirmation hearings. We are hearing nothing about Judge Jackson's motherhood, and it's been a big part of her story as a working woman and a lawyer in the legal profession. And again, maybe it's because Black women are so commonplace as working mothers. According to the Department of Labor, Black women are the majority of working mothers. Um, 70, I think it's something like 70 percent of Black women are who are mothers are also working mothers. It far exceeds that of other ethnic groups. So that may be part of it. It may also be that the Democrats are not as likely as the Republicans to tout a contender's um, family status as evidence of professional acumen or aptitude. But it seems like a pretty relevant story at a time when we are debating whether childcare is part of the infrastructure of our economy. I think it would be really useful and productive for the American people to hear how someone like Ketanji Brown Jackson reached the pinnacle of her career while also mothering two children. Why don't Democrats want to lean into that narrative? I mean, Republicans, they took it and ran away with it, and they really did, you're right, use it as a shield of basically any criticism of her political stances on abortion. They used her being a mom to shield her from those criticisms. Why shouldn't Democrats just lean into this idea that Judge Jackson is also a working mom and brings her perspective to the role of Supreme Court justice? Well, I think historically emphasizing a woman's motherhood, her family status has been um, somewhat maybe demoralizing, um, deprecating, and, and, and you really want the attention to be on her qualifications, as it should be. And her qualifications here are absolutely sterling, but I think that makes the working mother narrative even more compelling. She herself 
has talked frankly about how difficult it was to make it through the legal profession at a time when she had young children and how difficult it was to find work that was not only meaningful, but actually compatible with her family circumstances. So I understand why it may feel a little retrograde to emphasize this, but these are the kinds of relatable problems that all working women are having if they are trying to combine work and family matters right now. And not just women, men are doing this too right now. It would be really useful, I think, to think about how someone like Judge Jackson reached the pinnacle of her career while also managing this juggle. And she notes, there were some detours. Her ascent to the Supreme Court was not always assured. She made it. And that, too, I think, speaks to qualities that make her suitable for the bench, her grit, her resilience, her fortitude. But we should have that conversation. Justice Amy Coney Barrett right now is the only mom on the Supreme Court. And her deeply conservative beliefs about reproductive health and freedom uh, puts her in a specific place in terms of the conversation ongoing right as the court is deciding the Mississippi case. I mean, t speak to how Judge Jackson's perspective, coming from the perceivably the left on this issue, and the fact that she's also a mother can help shape the conversation in the future when cases come before the court. We definitely saw this on display in December in the oral arguments in that abortion case where Justice Barrett asked about infant safe haven laws, which allow a parent to leave a newborn at a fire station or a police station and surrender the child for adoption. And Justice Barrett seemed to be suggesting that if you could disaggregate the burdens of pregnancy and the burdens of parenthood, maybe there isn't a need for a right to abortion because women aren't forced into motherhood that would perhaps delay or deter them from education or employment. Um, I think Justice Jackson could bring a different perspective to that. Not only is she a black woman, she could talk about the experiences that many black women have during pregnancy, the heightened maternal mortality rates that they face during pregnancy, the difficulties of finding childcare as a working mother. All of that, I think, would speak to some of these questions that we're having where right now, only Justice Barrett's voice as a working mother is being heard on that court. So Justice Barrett is not the first uh, working mother on the court with Bader Ginsburg, Sandra Day O'Connor, also working moms. Was their experience as working moms reflected at all in any of their decisions or dissents or arguments on the court? Well, by the time both of them came to the court, um, and this really spoke to when they became lawyers and the difficulties women faced in the legal profession at the time they were leaving law school, um, their children were well out of the house by the time they came to the court. Um, their children were grown and gone, so to speak. So Justice Barrett is the first mother of school-aged children on the court. But I think we saw in a lot of different ways um, the way in which Justices O'Connor and Justice Ginsburg's experiences as women, as mothers, shaped their time on the court. I think we saw it most profoundly in Justice Ginsburg's decision in United States versus Virginia. That was the case in which the court invalidated the Virginia Military Institute's adversative method, which only allowed men to matriculate at that state school. She talked about the idea that, yeah, there may not be a lot of women who would choose that. But if there was one woman who would choose that particular educational experience and she was suited for it, then she had to be given a chance. And I think she was thinking about all of the experiences that she had been locked out of as a working mother entering the legal profession back when she graduated from Columbia Law School. It's such an important it's conversation. And I feel like, you know, we don't have it enough. The, the idea that we're sort of changing the model for not just Supreme Court, but also Congress, because, you know, there is sort of the Speaker Pelosi model of running for office where you do all the things, you have your kids, you raise them, you may even have grandchildren by the time you decide to run for office, or this model where you're a little bit younger, you may have smaller children. It's a fascinating conversation as we, you know, we try to be regressive on these things. Melissa Murray, Professor, thank you so much for being here. You're always fun to talk to you about just anything. So come talk about anything. Thank you again. Please stay safe. That does it for me tonight. I'm Zerlina. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube. Mehdi Hassan is coming up next after a short break right here on The Choice from MSNBC.
Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.